I'm Nathan Fowkes. I am a concept artist. That's actually the exciting thing about animated movies, which is where I spend most of my time, because usually uh, each movie has its own topic, its own subject, and uh, even within that show, we'll jump around and have different locations and sequences. And so it's quite an adventure because we get to cover a lot of ground. Uh, most of my experience, my first 15 years in, was at DreamWorks. We did The Prince of Egypt, we did Ancient America with El Dorado, The American West with Spirit. Uh, we went under the ocean with uh, Shark Tale. And so we, we covered so much ground and continue to do so in uh, animation and in games as well. I love organic stuff. Uh, uh, it's fun to take a break and do something that's a little bit more hard edge cityscape or sci-fi, but um, uh, I, I do love the, uh, the foliage, the landscape. In fact, uh, I don't know if everyone is aware, but here we are in Paris right now, and I just finished a speech on the uh, power of the landscape in concept art, and I picked that topic. They allowed me to pick my own topic, and I picked that because that's one of the topics that I do love the most. It is, uh, it's uh, bringing meaning to the chaos. You know, nature has patterns and has meaningful relationships in it, and there's a lot of randomness and chaos at the same time. And that's a big part of art, is uh, taking all of the stuff that uh, makes up our pictures and putting it together in a meaningful way. Uh, it's a huge challenge, but that's also what I love about doing it. That's kind of the nice thing about artists. You know, uh, I hear writers say, uh, that life is never boring because even when bad things happen, it's in still a new idea. You know, they can incorporate that into a story and bring some drama or some real life experience to it. And it's the same with, uh, with art. Everything is reference. You know, you, you see a strange texture or an interesting plant and you think, you know, you grab your phone and snap a picture of it because you think, I can probably use that. That's an, you know, that's an alien looking plant right there. And uh, next time I do a sci-fi show, I can, some of those weird shapes, I can be inspired by them. So everything's a reference. It kind of helps, uh, one more thing to help make life worth living. I'm, I'm an average guy, but average people, if they practice anything on a daily basis, they, you kind of go through that uh, repetition leads to refinement, which ultimately leads to mastery. And so, uh, uh, you know, Anybody who's determined can uh, learn to do something special. And the sketchbook is the road, it's your passport to doing that. I really love thumbing through old sketchbooks. Uh, I think it's true for most people, maybe all people. We tend to attach memories to pictures. And so you're spending time making a picture and the memories of that moment or that time are attached to it. So I'll go back through sketchbooks and they may have nothing written down. They're not a journal, but it takes me back and I remember, sometimes I even remember what music I was listening to while I did that sketch. I remember, you know, what was going on. So it's a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a walk through history. And at the same time, in our history as artists or, or anybody, there are things we're interested in, but then we move on from. And it's kind of fun to rediscover like, oh, I was really interested in this subject and I'd kind of forgotten about it, but I shouldn't have because it was, it, it was a new insight. And so it's been helpful to go back. You always ask yourself the question, for instance, when you go to sketch anything, you usually don't have a lot of time to do it. And so, uh, uh, you're not gonna be able to render every single detail and subtlety that you see, you wouldn't want to. So you always have to ask yourself, what's the reason, you know, what is it about this thing that made me wanna sketch it? And you've gotta pin down what the answer to that is and then stick to it because it's so easy to drift into autopilot and start rendering random bits and then all of a sudden, the sketch loses the thing that inspired you about the subject. So you ask yourself that question first, and then everything you do, every mark that you make, every tone that you put down, should be an effort to describe that thing that inspired you. Lighting in animation design is storytelling. So you've got to, it's, in fact, it's a perfect question. I, I appreciate it because it follows the sketchbook uh, question where you pin down what it is about that thing, and then you stick to it. And so in animation, in every single scene, you would identify what's the important element of the story and what's the mood and emotion the audience is meant to feel. 
And once you have that firmly in place, then you come up with lighting that designs for it. So uh, it's useful for me and I think many artists to think in terms of contrast. The eyes pulled to contrast and you know anything that's soft or dark or, or washed out, our eye just doesn't tend to go to it. And so you design the lighting such that you bring the important elements into contrast and you've got to be willing to let go of the secondary stuff. Sometimes it completely disappears into shadow, sometimes it completely burns out into light. And through that, you inform the audience what's primary about that story moment, and you can totally control that with your lighting design. We all have our style, and we kind of have some of our go-to ideas uh, that, you know, that tends to be what creates style. We have certain ways of doing things. But um, I'm trying to think of some specific examples, because uh, some shows we've specifically used Spotlighting, you know, was an, an overall uh, overall look of picture, and uh, and other shows we've used exposure, where uh, you intentionally burn out the lights to really see into the shadows, or you intentionally uh, let the shadows just go completely to to dark or to neutral, so you can really see what's in the light, and so it's something that you take on a case by case basis. And it's also something that's determined by the look of picture, you know, for a particular film. Usually, uh, so the hierarchy tends to go, there's the director, there's the production designer who's head of everything visual, and then working with the production designer are an art director or two, and then beneath that is the team of artists. So ultimately, it's the production designer and the director who make the final decisions. But um, a good concept artist is often the person who creates the images that help them make that decision. So the director won't necessarily tell you how to do your job in most cases. They shouldn't. They tell you what the story is. And then a visual development or a concept artist needs to be the one who says, okay, if that's what your story is, this is how we can make it look to tell that particular story. So the concept artist is the person who often gets to inform the director on how to visualize the story. Um, I, I would like to give myself uh, a lot of credit. You know, it's, it's very nice to say uh, I teach because I want to give back. And I do, but I'll, I'll tell you the origin of it, uh, of when I started teaching. Uh, after, uh, let's see, after my third DreamWorks film, uh, I wanted to take a little bit of a sabbatical. I had always been interested in life drawing. I'd worked on it, I'd fought for it all through high school and, uh, and art school. At DreamWorks, I went to all of the life drawing sessions. But it's back to that saying, you know, to be good at something just does not feel good enough when your hope is to someday be great at it. And so I asked DreamWorks for a six month sabbatical to go off and paint and draw and try and get up to the next level. And so I went to a local art school, an atelier where they did primarily life drawing and traditional work. And I said, hey, you know, I'm a DreamWorks artist. Uh, would you be interested in allowing me to teach here what I know about animation and what we do at DreamWorks in exchange for sitting in on the life drawing classes, going to the uninstructed sessions? They were pretty agreeable to that. Um, you know, it looks good for them to have a DreamWorks artist on staff. And so, uh, and so I did that deal. And I'll tell you, for six months solid, uh, I did that. I showed up every day at 9 o'clock, and I stayed all the way till 10 p.m. And I did that five days a week solid. I never missed a day, all day, every day. And then Saturday, I'd go out and do landscape painting all day. And then uh, took a break. You know, you don't want to burn out. It was a pretty intense schedule. Took a break on Sunday. And that's actually how I got started teaching. And uh, I've, been, I've been teaching ever since. It, it is, uh, uh, you know, if, if you do your best at it and try and do a good job, it's enriching for everybody, including the instructor. You know, it's a new world out there, and uh, it's a great time. It's, it's probably the best time in history to be an artist. And in every city, everywhere in the world, uh, game and animation studios are popping up. But in some areas, they don't have a history of experience with that. And so they need people who've been in the game for, I, I've been in for 25 years now. And so there's a real need out there and a, a real request that uh, people that have some experience uh, can, can offer classes. So yeah, at schoolism.com, 
uh, we've set that up and we have, uh, we have uh, instructors there. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of what we have going because we have people, every studio you can think of, we have instructors who either are working there or have worked there. We even have uh, the godfather of, uh, of, of digital painting, it, Craig Mullins, who we have on board now at Schoolism. So uh, it brings to all of these places the uh, experience of uh, artists that have historically been concentrated more in uh, the bigger cities and especially in Los Angeles and San Francisco. If you're doing this, you're not kidding around. This is an all or none business. And uh, I mentioned a moment ago, it's the best time in history to be an artist. At the same time, people know this. And so, so many people would love to get into it. And so there's a sea of 10,000 across the world, a lot more than that, I think, hopeful concept artists. And the only way to take those opportunities is to stand above that crowd. And so uh, uh, one, one thing that uh, people say that's helpful because we look around and, and say, oh, I'd love to do that, I'd love to do that, but there's this other cool thing, I'd love to do that. So it's good to think back when you were 13 years old, before you became very self-conscious and trying to impress everyone, what did you love to draw the most? And that just might be, you know, what your thing really is. And at the same time, there's some major pitfalls and I can throw out the caution because at the project that I'm working on now, I'm uh, working on uh, feature film, Paramount Animation. And uh, we're, we're really proud of this project and I've been uh, doing concept art and, and color scripting the movie. And so we were looking for a young artist to come in and kind of fill in the gaps between concepts that were being created. So a really good artist coming straight out of school. So our production designer went to a portfolio review day and he looked at dozens of portfolios. He came back the next day and I asked him, I said, so did you find anyone you think you know, would be good for, to help us out? And he said, no, nope, I didn't see a single portfolio that I liked. I was really surprised. This is LA, we have some good art instruction, a good history. And I said, my gosh, what was the problem? And he said, you know, every single portfolio that I looked at, it looked like they were trying to do a style or a technique. And not a single one of them was trying to create an emotion and tell a story with their work. And so I had to pass on all of them. Well, there is, uh, uh, here's that opportunity, you know, uh, this is somebody's big break. Hey, we'd like you to come and work at a major studio. And every person with their portfolio out that day, they miss that opportunity. A major studio, they're ready to hire. And that's the biggest pitfall that I see, the, the shortcuts, the digital trickery, making things cool with a limited amount of knowledge relying on the tools. Uh, it's kind of the road to the dark, the quick and easy road to the dark side uh, instead of the daily grind to slowly build yourself up to that level. But it's worth the fight because uh, not only is it the best time to be an artist in all of history, um, uh, the, the opportunities. Uh, right now I'm, uh, I've been invited to go to Paris, France and uh, uh, it's a huge, I, I almost can't believe that I'm here and invited as a professional to come and speak. And uh, these opportunities come our way when we fight that fight to uh, get to that level where we do something which is the foundation of concept art, having the visual ability to reach out and connect with our audience.